Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Peter Calcara, uh, PICPA's uh, Vice President of Government Relations. I want to uh, welcome all of you to our last PICPA legislative update webinar of the year, um, this day before Thanksgiving. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to spend the next 50 minutes or so with you um, and hopefully give you some uh, updates as to how the, the General Assembly ended, uh, election update, and, and some other things. So I, I just want to uh, uh, thank you all. So uh, get right into it. The uh, 2000, uh, actually the 201st session of the Pennsylvania General Assembly, which be, began way back on January 3rd of 2017, Pennsylvania's legislative sessions are two-year uh, sessions, uh, some of the longest in, in, in any state legislature in the country. Uh, this session ends officially at midnight on November 30th. So um, the two years uh, of, of session comes to a close. Anything that was not acted upon by the General Assembly will have to be re reintroduced in, in January. It is a, as, as many of you probably know, it's a very slow and methodical process. I think, however, um, and I know from colleagues in other states and they talk about you know, Texas is in once every other year. Maryland is in 90 days. Um, you know, a lot of pressure, I think, to get things done in a hurry in, in, in those sessions. Um, maybe it's because I've been doing this for 30 years. I, I like the uh, I like the long game that that, that we have in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, the 2018 uh, year was very successful for the PICPA. We had a number of uh, legislative victories that, that, I'll, that I'll talk about um, over the course of, of the last year or so. Um, talk about obviously the elections, uh, update you on that because obviously that's setting the, setting the playing field for the 2019, 2020 year. Um, our successes though, legislatively uh, and in, the, in the, the political arena, uh, really are a team effort um, you have a government relations team here in Harrisburg, as you can, some of you maybe see, um, you can't see the Christmas tree that's being put up, but you can see the Capitol. That's how close, literally, we can see who's walking across the, uh, into the Capitol. We have a, an active government relations team that's in the halls, gathering information, building relationship with legislators, but that's, that's one component of it. The other, uh, perhaps in my view, more important uh, is the volunteer commitment that we receive um, through hundreds of volunteers on our key committees um, that help us you know, vet legislative initiatives, come up with uh, policy positions and, and are really our tactical resource. So to those members who are on the call, um, the members of our state tax committee, our federal tax committee, uh, our local government auditing and accounting committee, uh, uh, our um, legislation committee and our CPA PAC board of trustees, CPA PAC being uh, the political arm of the, the PICPA. And to those of you who are involved in other aspects of the PICPA, thank you. Um, you're the reason we are successful, not only legislatively, but in the political arena. So real quickly, you see our uh, the, uh, the topic uh, discussion points for the day have to start with the election because that's really setting up the again the stage for next year next session uh, review our successes quickly for 17 and 18 um, preview of 2019 and um, if any of you have been reading the news I think you you're aware that uh, recently the independent fiscal office just this actually last week uh, put out their uh, five-year forecast and the news is not real good and um, I think it um, pretty ominous sign for the next couple of, of, of budget years. And if, hopefully have time if you have any questions. So uh, election recap, um, let's talk about the governor. The governor's race real quick, real quickly. Uh, I don't think this uh, 17 point victory by Tom Wolf over Scott Wagner was much of a surprise to most. Um, the governor, um, you know, adopted kind of a, a what I'll call a, a rose garden strategy that, that presidents have adopted in the past where he kind of tries not to engage his opponent because he's in a pretty pretty strong position. And I think Wolf uh, parlayed that into a pretty significant uh, victory. And if you think about where he came from four years ago, um, coming out of nowhere to win, capture um, uh, the, the nomination four years ago against 
um, much more well-known candidates at the time. It's a pretty significant, uh, pretty significant accomplishment. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have a new lieutenant governor. Mike Stack was not reelected, and lieutenant governor and governor in the primaries run separately. We have a new uh, lieutenant governor, John Fetterman, who's an imposing individual. I saw him uh, a couple of weeks ago on the campaign trail uh, at one of the turnpike stops, and he's a very imposing individual. Um, interesting, uh, he's not a suit and, uh, suit and tie kind of guy, so it's going to be interesting to see how he pres presides over the state Senate. Um, and interestingly, both of these men are from York, uh, and actually three of the four candidates, uh, Scott Wagner being from York as well, three of the four candidates uh, running for uh, the, the two offices are from York. So Pennsylvania's political power center is, is uh, York, Pennsylvania. And as a York native, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty proud of that. So uh, Mr. Fetterman, uh, who is currently the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of, of the Pittsburgh area, grew up, as I said, in York, graduated from Albright College, um, master's degree from Connecticut, I believe, and then a master's in public policy from the Harvard's uh, from Harvard's Kennedy Center for Government. Uh, it ran for U.S. Senate a couple years ago. Uh, very progressive, uh, very well thought of in in a lot of uh, the, the, the progressive circles. So it's going to be interesting to see how how those two work. What can we see from uh, the Wolf Fetterman team uh, as far as policy initiatives? Well, obviously we'll have to wait for specifics until the governor does his budget address in February, but. Obviously, uh, funding for public education is clearly going to be uh, continue to be a number one priority. Um, in the tax policy area, a severance tax um, that's that's going to re reemerge, and with changes at the legislative level, um, you know the, the the chances of that getting getting through with a, a compromise um, have uh, have trended in in the in um, in the positive direction for those who want a severance tax. Um, Possibly a higher minimum wage, um, an expanded uh, eligibility in overtime. That uh, the governor's uh, Department of, of Labor and Industry has uh, proposed a couple changes there, so we could possibly see that. Um, in other tax policy, I think you're going to see combined reporting again. That that is um, not going to go away. Uh, I think that's going to be. Uh, I'd be shocked if we didn't see governor mention it in his budget address. Uh, and additional workforce funding. So there's a couple of issues that we could possibly see uh, the, the Wolf Fetterman team um, continue to push as their uh, their legislative agenda in the 1920 session. Um, real quickly on this, uh, Bob Casey is elected to his third term overwhelmingly by a, a 12 or 14 point margin. Um, uh, you know, Senator Casey really captured upon um, a strong anti-Trump sentiment in the southeastern part of the state to to just roll to victory. Uh, I think this election was called at 801 by the national uh, media sources. So uh, no, no surprise here. Um, Senator Casey's uh, on a number of key committees uh, that both the PICPA and the AICPA are interested in. And he's always been very accessible to listening to uh, the CPA point of view. Real quickly on turnout, I think it's important to note that statewide, um, the turnout was the highest in a number of years. Statewide turnout was 58% um, of our 8.6 million voters. So a really high turnout. Midterm elections are really typically in that 40% range, so significantly higher in Pennsylvania, 58. And in the uh, the southeast, the collar count, uh, the collar counties outside of the city of uh, Philadelphia, uh, were were even higher than that. Uh, for example, Montgomery was 68%, uh, Chester saw 66% turnout, and Buck 64. So that kind of turnout uh, really propelled Casey to, a, to his third term. Um, the good news for us, for the PICPA, for the 22,000 members of the PICPA and our CPA PAC Board of Trustees is the re-election of five uh, CPA legislators. I call them the CPA Caucus, uh, led by um, the senior member now, Pat Brown, uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee from the Lehigh Valley. Pat was in a very, very close race. Um, he won um, with only um, by a, a margin of, of, of two points, 51 to, to 49 percent. So very, very close election. Um, you can that's the kind of the southeast influence. Um, and it, his victory wasn't secured until probably around 10 or 1030 that night. So 
Um, we're certainly glad to have him back. On the House side as well, Representative Mike Pfeiffer is now the dean of the CPA House Caucus. Uh, Mike, uh, then Representative George Dunbar, Keith Greiner, and, uh, and Frank Ryan, uh, we're all both reelected by pretty significant margins. The two faces you don't see here are John Marr from Allegheny County, who decided to retire uh, after um, two decades in the, in the House, and Michael Kaur, who was a freshman. Uh, we're sorry to see both of those uh, both of those individuals decide not to run this year. Um, all four of the members of the CPA caucus in the House are members of the Finance Committee and also members of the Appropriations Committee. So uh, having that access and that voice on those committees is, is, is obviously very important to the PICPA. Um, Representative Pfeiffer, because of his seniority, is in line for a committee. Uh, there are a couple of us uh, who have our fingers crossed that maybe the House Finance Committee may fall his way because it's um, uh, the chairmanship is open. Uh, it might be a little bit of a of a stretch, but uh, Representative Piper should get a uh, a, a committee uh, this this session. Uh, these individuals were all supported by the CPA PAC pretty significantly. So those of you who supported the PAC, you can see where uh, this, where most significant amount of your resources went. Let's talk about the state house race. So, uh, the state house. Uh, so, going into uh, the November sixth election, uh, House Republicans had a 121 to 82 um, uh, majority, pretty significant majority. Uh, a lot of a lot of territory to to protect with 121 members. After the election, um, they uh, the House Republicans lost 14 seats um, outright. Um, they did win three seats. Democratic seats for a net loss of 11 seats. So Democrats gained a net uh, 11 seats, which is pretty pretty significant. You can see two vacancies. Uh, we already have two two vacancies. Um, Representative Sid Michael Kovolich uh, passed away uh, in October, kind of unexpectedly. Um, he was on the ballot and was, uh, I think he was unopposed. So you'll have a special election for that seat sometime in early part of 2019. And Representative uh, Vanessa Lowry Brown from the Philadelphia area, who was caught up in a, uh, in a sting operation a couple of years ago, finally went to trial and was convicted on a, a number of counts uh, involving bribery and some other things. Um, she was reelected. Uh, and we'll have to resign in January in a special election for for that uh, for that uh, state house seat. So the numbers uh, right now, uh, beginning let's say uh, beginning in January, will be 110 to 90 uh, to 91. Uh, I think um, part of the national mood that was trickling down, we heard from a number of, of legislators at the state level, state house members, who said that. Uh, when they would go door to door, people would say, you're a Republican, you're with Trump, we have to vote against you. Um, that, that kind of national uh, trickle down uh, is, is, is somewhat rare, uh, but it was played a, a big impact, particularly in, in the southeast part of uh, the state. And also, uh, as Tip O'Neill, former Speaker of the House, would say, all politics are local, and there were a number of local issues, too, that uh, derailed uh, uh, some incumbents. So by their numbers, uh, Republicans lost uh, 14 seats, uh, eight incumbents, and six of the open uh, open seats uh, were flipped from Republicans to Democrats. Democrats, uh, Republicans flipped three Democratic seats. Uh, two were incumbents, and one was an open seat for a net gain of of um, net gain of 11 seats. Uh, I'm just going to cover quickly uh, some of the uh, the flip seats in the state house. Um, just as a, uh, just a, uh, won't be covering all of them, but just the one, those seats that, that flipped. Um, you, and you could see who the, um, uh, in some of the cases, who the incumbents are. In the, in the 56th, 53rd state house seats, that was uh, Representative God, Bob Godshaw's seat. Uh, Stephen Malagari uh, defeated, uh, won, that seat, won that race. He's a La uh, Lansdowne councilman. Uh, and he's also a sales consultant for a, a beverage uh, a beverage consultant. Liz Han Han Hanbridge uh, defeated Kate Harper, uh, incumbent Kate Harper, who is was chairman of the House Local Government Committee. Um, she is a lawyer and child advocate. Uh, Dan Williams um, won the seat uh, vacated by Harry Lewis, who retired. 
Um, Mr. Williams is a pastor with a church in Coatesville. Uh, and when the Allman uh, won the Marguerite Quinn seat, Representative Quinn uh, ran, um, opted not to run for a House seat, but run for a state Senate seat and, and lost. Um, Ms. Ullman is a professor at Bucks, uh, at community colleges in Bucks and Montgomery counties. A couple of the other Democratic flips um, in the State House uh, 146, uh, Joe uh, Ceresi, Sir, Sir, I'm sorry if I'm butchering these names, uh, defeated incumbent Tom Quigley. Uh, Mr. Quigley um, held this seat before, lost. Uh, and came back and won the seat again and now has lost. So I think we're probably uh, uh, done with uh, Tom Quigley in the House. In the 150th uh, open seat, this is the seat being vacated by Michael Kaur. As I mentioned, Representative Kaur was a, uh, is a CPA. Really sorry to hear see that, see that he is uh, not running, uh, decided not to seek re-election, but uh, family reasons, um, he decided that uh, it was just too much and will go back into uh, private industry. Mr. Webster um, is um, had a, has had a career in the military. In the State House 155th, uh, Danielle Free Otten defeated incumbent Becky Corbin. And this goes back to, um, as I said, local issues. Um, uh, Danielle, uh, Ms. Freel Otten uh, is a, a community leader uh, and is running on really one one major issue, and that's a pipeline going through her district. Um, and that was the local issue that she used to propel her uh, to defeat uh, Representative uh, Corbin. Um, Melissa Schusterman defeated incumbent Warren Camp. And this is a significant loss from the business community's perspective because Representative Camp was a, a, uh, a pro-legal reform champion and in, in introduced a number of bills that did not sit well with the state trial bar. and. Quite frankly, the trial bar targeted him as their number one uh, target. And uh, as you can see, uh, they took him out pretty easily. And that uh, does not bode well for the legal reform agenda for the business community more moving forward, but um, it, it, it is what it is. Um, Ms. Uh, uh, Schusterman is an owner of a digital video business in the, in the district. And Christina Sappy defeated incumbent Eric Rowe. Uh, Mr. Rowe was in his first term. Uh, Ms. Sappy is a um, uh, staffer, uh, district office staffer uh, for currently for Representative uh, Carolyn Kamita. Real quickly on a couple of these other flips. Um, State House uh, 162, this is the old Mick, Nick Micarelli. David De Delosio, I, I think that's, um, uh, it should be an O instead of a U, um, won that seat. He's a, uh, a truck driver and current uh, Teamster president. House 163 District in Delaware County. Um, Mike Zabel defeated incumbent Jamie Santora. Mr. Zabel is a former district attorney and in private practice now. Jennifer O'Meara defeated in, uh, freshman a Alex Charlton uh, in this Delaware County seat. Um, she is a, she's a, um, works at uh, University of Penn. And in the 167th, Kristen Howard defeated Dwayne Mill. And uh, Joe Hohenstein defeated uh, won that 177th, and that is the uh, seat being vacated by John Taylor, the 177th. Um, and with this win, the Democrats now control almost the entire House delegation uh, of, the, of Philadelphia County. Uh, the only uh, the only portion does not control or. Uh, does not have under its um, purview is uh, Representative Martina White's uh, district. Moving on to real quickly, state house seats uh, that Republicans split. There's three Republicans finally defeated uh, Brian Barbin. Um, they've been targeting him for a number of years. Mr. Rigby, James Rigsby, Rig, Rigby, who defeated him is in law enforcement. Um, Stephanie Barowitz defeated Mike Hanna Jr. This was an open seat. Mike Hanna Sr. was not running and Mike Hanna Jr. was running in his place and he was defeated. And Wendy Tom Thomas defeated Helen Ty. Um, this was a rematch from the special election earlier this year where Ms. Ty won and in the rematch uh, Thomas won by, uh, by uh, a small, small majority, a small margin. 
So there, there you have the, the flip seats, uh, both Republic, Democrat and Republican. Again, uh, we're going from 121 um, to 82 seats to a 110 to 90, uh, eventually 93. Those two vacancies will, will likely be Democratic seats. Um, what does this all mean? Uh, I think for the Republicans, quite frankly, um, having 121 uh, was both a blessing and a disguise. Some of you may have heard me say that before. Keeping trying to corral that many votes is 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 never easy. Um, but it also makes uh, probably it makes the caucus a little bit more conservative. Uh, so the divide between the House Democrats and the House Republicans probably. Uh, greater than it was going into the November 6th election. What does that mean? Getting a compromise uh, might be a little bit more difficult, might not. It all depends on what side of the, the which side of the aisle you're on. Um, but it does give it does certainly gives Democrats a little bit more leverage in in, in demanding to be more included uh, um, in in the process. So uh, it should be interesting to see how um, uh, the this the the new chamber functions. There was another election last year, uh, last year, last week. Um, both uh, the House and Senate elected their leaders uh, for the 2019-2020 session. Um, and these are the individuals who control essentially the calendar in each chamber, what bills are gonna run, what bills are not gonna run, where do bills get referred. Um, so if they wanna kill a bill, they'll send it to a committee that's favorable to killing it. Um, com uh, committee assignments, staff, parking spaces, office space. So this is the group that controls most of that uh, agenda. The new the new players here, uh, new in the sense that in new positions, Brian Cutler is the new majority leader. Uh, Representative Cutler from Lancaster County um, was majority whip for the past four years. And the whip is the person who does the vote count. He's the one who goes to the members and say, where are you on this bill or that bill? Um, and he tries to keep a vote count. That job now falls to Representative Karen Benninghoff, who's from Center County. Representative Benninghoff was chairman of the policy committee. Uh, and Mike Reese is the, the new secretary, caucus secretary. Um, he's uh, new to the caucus leaders, uh, to the caucus leadership team. So Terzai, Stan Saylor, Marcy Topol, Kurt Mosser, and, and representatives uh, Oberlander, although Oberlander is moving from um, secretary spot to policy chair. Uh, that is, those are uh, those are all returnees to the leadership team. Of course, uh, Cutler replaces Dave Reed, who did not seek re-election. Um, in the in the state house um, leadership race, yeah, we saw the southeast um, members of this caucus flex their muscle a little bit. Um, Frank Dermody was re-elected as uh, floor leader. Um, but the other top three leadership spots went to folks from the Southeast, Matt Bradford uh, from uh, Montgomery County, Jordan Harris from uh, Philadelphia, and caucus chair Joanna McClinton, uh, who's the first female African-American to hold that, that caucus chair spot. So the Southeast flexed their muscle a little bit. There was a little bit of a revolt. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan Frankel, a, a longtime member, uh, whip from uh, the Pittsburgh area was running for appropriations and lost to the Southeast. But again, um, the Southeast, that's where all the uh, the votes, uh, the new votes that the uh, House Democrats picked up are from the Southeast. So um, they wanted their share of leadership and they got it. Uh, the next step in this process that we don't have yet is the is the chairmanships. I mentioned with uh, Representative Pfeiffer, he's in line for a chairmanship. The question is, um, you know, where does he fall? But a number of key chairs in the House uh, chairmanship spots are open because of retirement um, and other uh, voluntary and not so voluntary, uh, including, as I mentioned, House Finance Committee, House Licensure Committee, Environmental Committee, Local Government Committee, uh, Consumer Affairs, uh, just uh, transportation, just a number of committees that are that are up. So over the next uh, several weeks, we'll find out who those individuals are. Turning to the Senate real quickly, uh, the Senate Republicans started with a 31-16 um, majority, almost the supermajority. As you may recall, going into 2017, they did have a veto-proof majority with 34 votes, but Scott Wagner earlier this year resi uh, resigned to run for governor, um, and they've been running with um, they've been running with 31 seats. Um, the Democrats had a very good night. Uh, they flipped five seats. 
five uh, previously held Republican seats to in, now into the Democratic uh, column. Four of those, again, are in the Southeast. So you can see where that influence is coming, the Southeast. Um, four incumbents and, um, or four a combination of incumbents and, and uh, open seats, and one open seat in Allegheny County the Democrats took. So now we have a 21, 29, 21 majority um, in the, to work with in the House. Real quickly, the flips, the Democratic flips, the 10th district, which was um, Representative McElhenney's uh, seat in Bucks County, uh, Rep, former Rep Steve Sanisario defeated Marguerite Quinn. In the 12th race uh, in Montgomery County, uh, Maria Collette defeated Stuart Greenlee Jr. Here was another uh, uh, race where uh, the son was trying to replace his father, Stuart Greenleaf Jr. Uh, or Stuart Greenleaf held, has held this seat for 40 years. So this seat now, after 40 years, is, is now a Democratic seat. In the 26th uh, senatorial seat in Delaware County, uh, Timothy Kearney uh, defeated incumbent Tom McGarrigle, and Lindsey Williams defeated, uh, this is the Allegheny County seat being vacated um, because of uh, the uh, primary defeat of Senator Randy Volokovich. Uh, Lindsey Williams defeated Jeremy Safer, and Katie Muth defeated incumbent uh, uh, John Rafferty in, in, that, uh, in that Chester, that's a combination Chester, Montgomery, Berks County seat. So 29, 21, uh, Senate, Senate also held leadership elections last week. Uh, and this chamber is um, on both sides of the aisles, a, a bit more stable, uh, no, uh, no newcomer, no changes here. Uh, just one, um, one point of interest, Pat Brown um, was reelected by his colleagues as chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And as you can see, Pat is CPA, only CPA legislator in, in the Senate. So. Pretty significant committee uh, to be chairman of because all bills have to go through the appropriations. Virtually all bills have to go through the appropriations committee. On the other side of the uh, the the, the, uh, the chamber um, or the chamber Senate uh, leadership team, no changes here. Uh, Jay Costa will be leading the um, Democratic caucus. Senator Hughes from Philly, Philadelphia, is the appropriations committee. Anthony Williams will be the whip again. Senator Fontana, um, chair, and uh, Senator Barnese, um, and Blake, and Boscola round out the, the leadership teams. Um, again, just the, the chairmanship positions um, are not, um, have not been selected at this point. Um, that's something that will happen again over the course of the next few weeks. Um, more stability here. Um, however, there's, there still could be some movement um, because uh, of, um, as I mentioned uh, back, a couple of these incumbents are open seats. Um, uh, Senator McElhenney uh, was chairman of the Liquor, uh, Liquor Committee, uh, Senator Greenleaf, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, um, Senator McGarrigal and, and Velakovich has both had chairmanships of committee, and I, but I forget what they are, but Senator Rapley, transportation. So a number of key committees in the Senate are, are going to be op opening up. Um, Senator Scott Hutchinson um, from uh, Western PA is chairman of the House uh, Senate Finance Committee. We certainly hope he stays on as chair, uh, but again, there might be a better opportunity for him and, 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 and the issues he likes to deal with. Uh, we're also hoping that Senator John Blake from Lackawanna County, who uh, is current uh, Democratic chair, stays on as that committee as well. Uh, real quickly on the congressional seats. Um, so going into November 6th, Republicans had a, uh, a uh, 12 to 6 um, majority of the Pennsylvania 18 congressional seats. Um, and after November uh, 6th, it's now 9-9. Um, including four women uh, and, uh, elected to the to the U.S. Congress to represent Pennsylvania. I'm pretty sure that's the largest contingent of women to represent that uh, pen, going to Congress from Pennsylvania, um, perhaps in history. Uh, we were saying that this. Um, we thought that there's the, the first women elected to Congress from Pennsylvania, but uh, someone just reminded us. Uh, 
Marjorie Margolis Mizvinsky, and of course, Al Senator Al uh, Congresswoman Allison Schwartz, who was a member of the Congress for uh, a decade or so. So, four women um, going to Congress. Uh, also, Dan Muser is a new member. Uh, you, some of you may recall, uh, Dan Muser is Secretary of Revenue under Tom Corbett. Corbett. Uh, Senator, State Senator Guy Rashenthaler won the new 14th congressional seat, uh, which opens up his state Senate seat. So once he resigns, there will be a set, special election. Um, and that will be a competitive race. That will be a competitive race in Allegheny County. Um, and in the, uh, um, in the congressional 17th, which was the only race in the country that pitted two, pitted two seated uh, members of Congress against each other, Connor Lamb, uh, Connor Lamb won, won that. Race um, in the Breschenthaler seat, uh, state Senate seat, um, Representative John Marr, as I mentioned before, who is retired, uh, is co is contemplating a run in that special election. And uh, I didn't forget him, but Brian Fitzpatrick, uh, PICPA. And I know the C uh, AICPA are pleased to have uh, Congressman Pat Fitzpatrick back for another for his second term in Congress. Um, he joins a group of uh, seven other CPAs. Um, CPA um, members of, of Congress. So congratulations to all the all the winners. So there you have, uh, in a nutshell, the um, the election results. What does it mean to PICPA? I, I think um, we're well positioned, not only because of our five CPA legislators, but because of, I think, going back to a comment early on that we I said that uh, you know the government relations team works. Um, like to think diligently to develop relationships on both sides of the aisle. There's some organizations that focus on one political party or the or the other. I think we try to focus because of our message and and, and because of the issues that 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 we're trying to educate members are. They're in most cases they're bipartisan. So I think we're we're well positioned to continue to um, um, be advocates for not only the profession uh, but of sound tax policy going into the 2019-2020 year. So really want to uh, briefly recap 17-18 uh, for you from PICPA's perspective. Again, I think we had a very, very successful uh, session. Um, there were over um, almost close to 4,000 bills introduced, actually 3,949 introduced at last count, uh, 2,688 in the House. and. Uh, 1,261 in the Senate. I think those numbers are down a bit for a two-year session, but um, 3, 000, over 3,000, uh, close to 4,000 bills introduced, uh, and only 276, and uh, and I believe uh, that includes budget bills, which have to be done every year, and there are about a dozen, dozen budget bills a year, not only the general fund, but all the other um, other bills that go along with, with that. Um, so about 7% of the bills that get introduced actually make it through the process, uh, and we had we had three this year, in four if you count the uh, if you count the depreciation proposal that we really spearheaded with a number of, of, of groups. But uh, real quickly recapping Act Five of 2017, um, immense pension reform, which is a pretty significant reform measure um, that we had been advocating for. It's not exactly what we were looking for. But it's a significant step in, in, in the right direction. And um, it's a model that other states are looking at, quite frankly, um, giving the employees the option. It, it doesn't force uh, employees into um, a defined contribution uh, plan, but it, it makes the option available. So it is a positive, an initiative that our fiscal responsibility task force has been calling for for um, eight plus years. Acts 71 and 72. Um, were spearheaded by Representative Keith Greiner, uh, again from Lancaster County, making necessary uh, updates to our Solicitation of Charitable Purposes Act. Uh, Act 71 increases the threshold for audits from, I think the level was 350 to 750,000, pretty significant increase. And then Act 72 made a number of technical changes to the SFCP law uh, to make it, the filing process simplified, we hope. Um, both of these bills, both of these bills went through the uh, legislative process without a single negative vote. Uh, we also supported legislation that allows for expungement of certain licensee records. 
Um, this is an initiative that we tried for a number of years to get through, included in our own CPA statute legislation, but finally made its way through uh, the process um, this year. It's Act 6 of 2018. Um, and just an FYI, if you're not aware or if you're interested in this, um, the, the Bureau of Professional Occupational Affairs uh, just released um, just released regulations uh, within the last week or so. So if you're interested, uh, you can find those on our website if you go to uh, the advocacy page of PICPA's website. And Act 18 of 2018, um, this is legislation streamlining um, Amendments to Act 32 of 2008, streamlining the local tax um, collection process and procedures uh, to make it more uniform and consistent across the board. Uh, this was legislation that Governor Wolf uh, vetoed actually in 2016. Uh, we came back with virtually the same legislation um, and were able to get it through uh, the House and Senate um, with very few negative votes. Um, and the governor, uh, after a meeting with him, agreed to support the legislation. Uh, one of, uh, that was spearheaded by Representative George Dunbar uh, and a number of members uh, from our um, state tax committee, uh, Dave Kaplan, Sherry Free, and Jim Newhart. Thank you. And, and everyone else who uh, helped lift that uh, over the goal line this year. And uh, the, the, the one of the mo more significant ones is Act 72 of 2018. The uh, the um, depreciate I call the depreciation bill that was signed into law by Governor Wolf uh, at the end of at the end of June. There you can see uh, we were in PSCPA was invited to the mock bill signing that happened uh, uh, in September I think with Senator Pat Brown uh, seated to the governor's left and Senator Michelle Brooks um, seated to the to uh, the, the left and Michelle Brooks uh, seated to the governor's left. Uh, Senator Pat Brown seated to the governor's right. Um, Representative Frank Bryan deserves a lot of credit. Um, he introduced the first bill working with the PICPA and others to, um, uh, to uh, address not only the Department of Revenue's uh, uh, bulletin on depreciation, um, but actually uh, make, make other changes to the law. So to Representative Ryan, uh, we appreciate his, his help and support. Ultimately, the General Assembly decided to go with Representative uh, uh, Senator Brooks's legislation, and that's the bill, uh, which was mostly very, very, I very similar to Representative Ryan's bill, but uh, uh, Represent Senator Brooks's bill was the one signed into law by uh, Governor Governor Wolf. So thank you to all who, who made that uh, particularly members of the state tax committee who who made that uh, legislation a success. So let's turn now uh, with a couple of re remaining minutes and talk about uh, what we anticipate uh, 2019 uh, to look like. Obviously, a lot of new faces. That's going to be one of our one of our challenges is there are going to be almost 50 new members to the state general assembly, House and Senate, 50. Um, that's a lot of that's a lot of legwork to get to know um, who these individuals are, uh, where they might uh, be on some issues. So that's going to be our priority number one is to um, reach out uh, to those those new members um, and other uh, and other members. That that's that's a constant. But reach out to the new members, introduce them to the PICPA, what we stand for, and offer to be a technical resource and a thought leader for them. Um, as, as some of these issues uh, move through the legislative process. A couple of um, calendar um, issues. Uh, so the General Assembly will uh, reconvene the 2019-2000 uh, uh, legislative session begins January 1 of 2019. So it's always the first Tuesday of, 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 of January uh, where the lawmakers get sworn in. So that's January 1. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how uh, how many uh, uh, what New Year's Eve is like in Harrisburg this year. But January one of two thousand and nineteen, um, all members, uh, new members, will, uh, members of the House and half the Senate will be sworn in. Um, governor Wolf and his um, lieutenant governor will be will take the oath of office on January fifteenth, and then Governor Wolf presents his budget address on February second. So um, after that, we process gets started. So 
the budget, obviously, I don't have it listed here, but that's going to be a uh, that's going to be uh, probably the most, without a doubt, the most significant issue that we have to deal with next year. Um, I mentioned early about the independent fiscal office issued their five-year uh, economic um, economic and uh, budget outlook for the fiscal years 2018-19 to 2023-24. Um, and I just want to read a couple paragraphs to you from the executive summary, just just uh, to put the, kind of this debate in context. From fiscal year 2018-19 to fiscal year 23-24, the forecast projects that general fund revenues will increase at an average rate of 3.1% per annum. The underlying rate increases to 3.4% per annum if a sales and use tax transfer that begins in fiscal year 2022-23 is excluded, $479 million for, for that year. The forecast assumes that the Pennsylvania economy operates at, at its long-term potential and a recession or slowdown does not occur. Uh, one other paragraph, um, the, the flip side of that, <clears throat> for fiscal year 2019-20, expenditures are projected to increase by 8.9%. The significant increases due to the non-recurrence of one-time savings measures used to support expenditures by the Department of Human Services, the expansion of health and human services programs, and reduced support from non-general fund sources um, like tobacco settlement fund. After that year, expenditures growth, uh, uh, expenditure growth gener greatly moderates and the projected imbalance levels off. So, Pretty ominous sign warning um, for the 2019-2000 budget year um, by the Independent Fiscal Office. Now, uh, members of the General Assembly may disagree with a lot of that, but they may disagree with some of that. But um, it's a clear warning that there's going to be some some uh, challenges with the next year's budget. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of um, which leads into my next point, uh, state tax reform. Uh, the Tax Foundation um, and also the House Finance Committee has a subcommittee that's looking at, at overall taxation in the Commonwealth. Um, this could be the impetus because of the challenges from uh, uh, identified by the Independent Fiscal Office and others, maybe, a cha maybe an opportunity for significant tax reform, uh, a, a debate uh, in, in Harrisburg. Um, the Tax Foundation study is not perfect. There's a, there's uh, clearly some issues with it, but it is a starting point for uh, a, a, a strong discussion of tax reform in, in the Commonwealth. So stay tuned. I think, um, you know, we had a very easy budget uh, for uh, this last year in June. Um, I think um, next year is going to be the complete opposite. We can revert back, potentially revert back to the way things were uh, the first two or three years under the, the Wolf administration. Some unfinished PICPA legislative business. Uh, we're still working on a technical fix or correction to uh, the 1099 miscellaneous withholding change that was enacted as part of the 2017 budget. Representative, again, Keith Greiner's bill 2413 makes a number of technical changes um, to that to that process. Um, that bill was reported out of the House Finance Committee, but we just ran out of time and we're not able to get it uh, get it any further traction on it. But it is an issue. Uh, hopefully, um, with the new chairman of the House Finance Committee, we'll be able to get traction on that legislation early in 2019. Representative Coors bill, House Bill 2303, did pass the House Finance Committee and the full House, went to the Senate, but just ran out of time. And uh, this is basically allows a revocable trust to be treated as a as part of an estate uh, for purposes of PIT filing. So that's just a kind of a, a, a tactical cleanup uh, provision, similar to how uh, the follows Fed, Fed language as well. A consolidation of business privilege tax. Senator Brown uh, proposed legislation uh, that made it out of the Senate, um, but was amended in the House and died um, died. In, in the process. And statewide EIT collection, I think you're going to see that legislation reintroduced. And statewide EIT collection study, that collect, that study, uh, PICPA met with the Department of Revenue several times to, to talk about that. Um, and I think you're going to see, <clears throat> um, I think the report is, is 
due out either later this month or uh, by the end of by the end of 2018. So that may generate some legislative interest in in the additional interest in the tax collection local tax collection process. Um, for the record, BICPA does not have a position on statewide collection of BIT. Um, the current system is working very well. Um, it uh, could always be improved, but uh, we're not advocates um, uh, one way or the other for statewide collection. Department of Revenue update. Um, our annual meeting was held uh, last month. Uh, a lot of good information. Uh, we did videotape that. I want to thank the department for, um, for, for participating in that. A lot of good information if you have time and you want to re, uh, view the, 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 the session. Uh, again, it was recorded. Um, a lot of uh, info um, on the cust a new customer service initiative uh, and also its um, tax modernization uh, uh, process and how that's faring. A couple of other, uh, a couple of other uh, pieces of information. Uh, the department uh, published in last week's uh, Pennsylvania Bulletin. It's updated with the holding of tax regulation, um, and that essentially reduces the threshold for electronic transmittal transmission requirement of uh, the annual reconciliation statement from 250 down to 10. Um, so that is uh, that's out there, and uh, it's uh, available on on uh, uh, the state's website uh, or. Yes, it's on the state's website, and you can find it on the Independent Regulatory Review site as well. So if you're interested in that, or send me an email, uh, and we'll get you a copy of that. And that is uh, now effective. Uh, and Board of Finance and Revenue, real quickly, uh, new guidelines on videotaping public sessions. So uh, public sessions at BFNR now will be uh, recorded, videotaped, and recorded and, and be available to the public. So, uh, that um, you can find a copy of that on our website as well if you go into the advocacy page or legislative update page. Um, with that, uh, a plug for the PAC. I want to thank those uh, who contributed this year. Uh, it was an important year for us. Uh, I think uh, you know the fact that we had five CP legislators returning is, is significant. Um, but for those of you who are not contributing, we'd, we'd ask it's still not too late to make your comp contribution for 2018. Less than 5%, less than 5% of PICP's 23,000 members uh, contribute to the CPA PAC. So we encourage you to uh, to support uh, the political efforts. Legislative efforts are one thing, uh, they accomplish a lot, uh, but if you don't have the, if you don't have the, uh, the resources like we do with the five CPA legislators, it's really um, much more difficult to get your legislative agenda through. And we'd like to wish all of you a uh, happy Thanksgiving. And uh, we will be back with a webinar uh, at some point in February after the governor's uh, budget address. So with that, um, uh, obviously, you're always welcome to reach out to me, um, email or, or, or call, and I'd be happy to uh, get back to you. With that, thank you all and have a great day.